yeah shivangi uh, one you kick off on talking about your journey yeah actually um, you know what gita said got me uh, thinking that uh, i i think i've come from a background of extreme privilege i like to think because i don't think i had a dad who really pushed me i never had to fight to you know or had any opposition when i said i wanted to do engineering and he's incidentally uh, from the first batch of imc and uh, you know so, so on yeah so uh, and then i wanted to go to imcal um so i don't think but i, I could relate to you talking about you know um, traveling and with no phones and all that pilani at that time uh, also mm-hmm. like that and i am see by the time we came to imc it was luxury because we had std although we would line up outside the booth you know outside the gate at the booth it seems uh, weird so anyway i uh, went to imc thinking i put engineering behind me and uh, did the traditional you know consumer marketing wanted to do fmcg marketing um then uh, you know for various reasons uh, i could not uh, continue with my campus job which was with kotak at that time and then i was you know i had personal uh, constraints i had to be in chennai and i was kind of lost and uh, meandering for a while and then satyam infoway was starting off which was you know the ceo was a neat guy i'm seeing ram raj and uh, sub, you know i wasn't finding anything in fmcg so as a kind of okay i have no other choice i joined sophie i was it was a startup at a time when startup was not a term used mm-hmm. and i was the sixth employee and then of course there was no turning back i kind of stayed in sefi for 10 years years mm-hmm. watched the entire uh, internet revolution the high of seeing the first ip network in india the first isp in india and so on and uh, uh, you know then i i mean i did a lot of deep dive into tech into sales i did product management etc and then in 99 um, sefi tied up with uh, berisign to set up the first certifying authority in india and that's when i got into the world of uh, you know cryptography and encryption and also policy on the other hand though at that time i didn't know it was policy work but i knew i was reading up the law and i was trying to figure out stuff which i had never done before to cut a long story short i uh, in, in, uh, basically um, ran the project where we set up the first ca in india and uh, then ran that business for about 5 uh, years from there i moved on to wipro for a short while i was running a global practice uh, so, so i came from a from a very entrepreneurial organization you know sefi mm-hmm. even though it grew very rapidly in 10 years the the dna was very entrepreneurial you know you were dumped with stuff you had to figure things out etc etc from there i went to a wipro which was you know a uh, ocean and uh, i very quickly realized that me being there made no difference you know i could well have not been there and the business would have grown the way it did and i was you know i felt i that i didn't have a chance to make a difference you were a cog in a wheel and i also then figured out that i'm not a large company person at all you know i don't think i have that in my dna i couldn't handle the politics and all of that so then i quit on a whim everybody when i look back i tell everybody no never do that uh, and then i packed up and moved from bangalore to pune and tried to start something uh, my first two ventures failed uh, wrong partners wrong business model whatever i mean now in a, you know hindsight is 2020 till i reached a point in 2012 when you know it was my mother was telling me it's high time you go back to a job you know and it's very, see i work by then i was specialized in infosec right i got a few certifications and etc and uh, you know there's a huge demand but i was kind of adamant and then i met my co-founder uh, who had just quit kpmg in a similar kind of whim and we said okay both of us are floating let's float together mm-hmm. and then we kind of uh, got into started arca and uh, from there it's been an interesting journey we started with uh, focusing on infosec but you know we kind of started dabbling in data privacy very early on realized that you know we were the very early birds in the space and started getting opportunities and then we sort of you know took that further so now at the end of 
you know it's been 11 years since we started arca so we're very specialized in data privacy and we've built india's first privacy management platform and we basically specialize in helping organizations implement privacy um, wow what an incredible uh, journey and like you said some of this is hindsight right um could have done this could have would have should have as they say part of it yeah. so it's uh, i think it's a great opportunity to actually sit and introspect on it uh, mm -hmm. so i think it's, it's it's fantastic listening to it um i also um, must say i i i sorry i'm going to interrupt i must say that you know at one point i was wondering what how we should take this forward uh, wanted to uh, to build a platform we needed to raise a round of uh, angel funding and i basically my first port of call was to turn to my elving batchmates in uh, imc and my you know the girls of my bitsin uh, wing mates and they all just overwhelmed me with the, i didn't have to look for this so i always say i'm blessed with angels around mm -hmm. oh, fantastic fantastic uh, uh, or oh, the special family and friends round for you right there from bitsin imc <laughs> lovely lovely Meenal, what about you? Yeah, hi. So I'm Meenal from the 30th batch. And um, just to like kind of, you know, add to what Shivangi was saying, uh, uh, it's been incredible seeing her grow, you know, from like where she was and her own journey. I've loved to see Shivangi's Arka go, go places. And it's been an amazing uh, journey that I've loved following. And she's a kind of a role model too, because her entrepreneurial journey was far earlier than mine. So I always, whenever I have, uh, you know, like when I feel a little lonely, I like that's one of the first uh, persons I call is Shivangi and like ask her, okay, now I'm stuck here, what do I do? So it's been a great thing to, you know, see Shivangi grow. Uh, coming to my own thing, basically, um, so after my engineering, I figured that engineering was not something that I enjoyed at all. So actually it could gap here to study for CAD because uh, in my engineering, I hadn't even heard of CAD actually. So I didn't know what IAMS was. And suddenly one fine day after I finished my engineering, I somebody just said that they were going to go to IMS to apply for CAT and then I said okay I'll also go with them and that was a training institute at that point of time and that's how I got to know about an MBA and I went to uh, to learn from them and then eventually got into IM Calcutta where I met really amazing girls and boys and then um, after my uh, okay so there I fell in love with finance and I, I thought okay that's what I wanted to pursue and uh, then uh, when I kind of got my first job at Crystal um, I met my husband there and it was all very nice. Uh, after a couple of years, I joined, I quit Crystal to join ICICI and um, ICICI was uh, ICICI Securities primary mm -hmm. dealership. So it was a very lovely place. Uh, you know, it, it was like the best organization I thought I, I got in terms of, uh, it had a nice work-life balance. At the same time, I was learning a lot. In, in, uh, so I was, in, uh, I was in the risk team and um, later on went on to head risk and was chief risk officer for almost 15 years there. And with the, so many upheavals, right, from Lehman Brothers to, you know, markets tanking. And there were so many things that happened, uh, like, you know, from 2008 to 2021 when I actually quit. So in those years, it, it was an amazing journey of learning, of having some great teammates to work with. And life was just perfect, you know, actually. Uh, there was no reason for me to quit or start anything on my own, except that uh, there was a pandemic that came in between. And before that, like, uh, when, uh, when my, I have one daughter who was when she was in grade eight, she wanted to be part of a robotics team and there was none in India, in Mumbai, uh, you know, the kind of robotics that she wanted to do. So we floated a team and 40 boys joined that team, but there was no girl. She was the only girl in that team. And I didn't want her to drop off just because she was the only girl. So I used to go after work to pick her up. And then uh, suddenly I know all my engineering came back and I was like, mm -hmm. okay, I, maybe I can just help them, you know, in some ways. So I started mentoring that team and that year the team did very well. And they went to the US for the world championships and stuff like that and uh, the thing that I saw with with the, in that year of mentoring was that these kids when they came in they didn't know what they were going to do they didn't know what was going to happen but uh, as they built the robots and as as they saw the ideas come to fruition and as they saw that you know the robots move they kind of really discovered themselves found a voice and it, that whole journey for me was very that whole transformation that happened in all the kids and especially my own daughter was very transforming and very rewarding so that is what made me continue with my mentoring journey and I kind of her school asked me to start and I was just a volunteer mentor for many years 
uh, during the pandemic, uh, you know, I kind of thought that uh, I was just wondering what I should do because um, there were a few NGOs that reached out saying that, you know, they didn't have laptops. And I uh, reached out to a friend in Amazon who said that they were, they were giving laptops, but they would only do all of this if I was an entity and not if I was, you know, like an individual. And I was wondering, like, should I then, you know, become an entity? And that was something that kind of gave me a push. The only thing was that in the interim six years, while I was mentoring uh, teams uh, and I was mentoring a lot of children, uh, I was doing it as voluntary, right? And now suddenly to quit a really well-paying job, a cushy corner office and everything was just perfect. Uh, it wasn't something that I was very ready to, I felt, you know, I that to take that leap of faith took me a lot of time. But for that, my inspiration was a mom who basically, you know, at who had got married at the age of 18 and had three daughters. And so till the time that she was 30, and by the time she was 24, she had three daughters. And then she was just a housewife for many, many years uh, until she was 35 when she first went out to do a art and craft co uh, course in PD Light Industries that they were used to give at that time. And she did that course, and but she wasn't getting a job. So she basically got a job as a temporary art and craft teacher in a school for the deaf uh, kids. And there was, uh, I mean, she didn't know anything, but she just went there. She did very well. She did so well that within a year, they made her like permanent and uh, and then after that they made her the head of department and after that when she was 50 they had introduced uh, you know computers in her school and what happened then was that uh, she all the other teachers by the time she was 50 all of us were out of her life right she had all the time in the world so she actually took to computers very naturally she learned a lot um, went on to uh, to become the head of that computer thing only from an art and craft teacher not knowing english to teaching computers to deaf kids, you know, that journey, like the way she learned and learned new skills because she learned, you know, like this was 10, 12 years ago in 2000, actually, 2000, 2001. So that many years ago to learn computers, to be able to teach was a, a very, like a very challenging thing, but she took it and she really ran with it. And then later on, uh, she kept in, improvising her skills, like learning from my daughter, from us and all of that, you know. And then when she retired, her school said that, uh, why don't you come back? But she then decided to be a social entrepreneur. So at the age of 58, she started her own venture. Uh, and uh, that uh, was to teach computer skills to kids from all deaf schools across Mumbai. So all those co kids come here. And it's an amazing venture that she has because over the last 10 years, uh, you know, rather more than 10 years, she's 72 now. So it's like 14 years now. She's been doing such amazing work and like all kids uh, across Mumbai come there. She is recognized with the state government. So, uh, you know, her courses are certified by the government of uh, Maharashtra. And the way I've seen her grow, right, and how she's taken risks and how she's really managed well, I thought, okay, maybe with, and she had no networks. Like we, we can talk about an IMC, like, like how Shivangi said, you know, you just make a phone call and you can always find somebody to help you, right? She had no network. She was like this on her own and she still did everything. So she was a big inspiration. So when these guys said, would you like to start something on my own? I just looked at her and maybe I did take a lot of time, but I said, if she can do it, maybe I can do something at least. So that was my, you know, push into entrepreneurship. And I've enjoyed every single moment of the last two years. I quit in October 2021 to start the innovation story which is an organization that empowers kids uh, with uh, skills for the uh, for 21st century. And basically, it really, um, these skills, I think, are so important because the world of technologies around us is changing so fast. And our schools somehow have not kept pace with that. Uh, so as, as consumers of technology, they, they are so ahead. But if they were back and if they had to design technology, it would be so good. So that was the whole idea for, uh, for that and to create instead of just consume. And uh, and we are doing a great job, I feel, with, because we are partners to Amazon on a program called Amazon Future Engineer, which the focus is inclusion. So we work with kids from ac across diverse backgrounds and with a lot of girls. I have an entity called Trailblazer, which focuses on girls in STEM. So I'm yeah, gonna, so it's like a, yeah, it's a, I'm going to come to all of that uh, for sure. So I'm just yeah, asking, absolutely. sorry, I'm just so pausing now at, uh, you know, at this time when obviously we're talking about digital and innovation. It's also the gender equality. And I really like the tribute that you are paying to your mother by bringing her journey in uh, as well. And I just want to acknowledge that, uh, you know, before we move on to your journey, I mean, amazing inspiration, definitely on Women's Day. Maybe we should do a session sure with her at some point in time <laughs> as well. Yeah, I and she's just a 10th pass, you know, in Marathi medium. She got married at 18, just after 10th standard. So she's not even like educated, educated in the real world, but she's very educated. <laughs> Education is overrated, even if I say that yes. in an IMC context. So yeah, no, I, I, I'll stick with you, Meenal, if that's okay. I want to know about, you know, just, just jump a little bit more into the motivations uh, for why we do what we do today uh, kind of thing. And 
you know if, if the viral uh, ayo shraddha video where she says uh, diversity mm. and inclusion actually goes to adversity mm. and exclusion uh, when there is a thing we have seen this play out right and the, so while we yeah. say the future is here the future is unevenly distributed so your work uh, on driving curiosity innovation confidence collaboration for the children so i mean i want to hear a bit more about uh, especially in the context of gender equality about your trailblazer program uh, so if you can just you know uh, specifically talk about that as well sure so trailblazer was specifically a design to get more girls into stem because what is happening currently is like i i floated four robotics teams in schools like you know really privileged schools like the dubai ambani international school aditya billa world academy even the united world college singapore and the first year there were no girls in uh, in these teams like in the ambani school that was just my daughter but the other teams there were no girls at all and i was so surprised i thought like at least with privileged schools you know this won't be the case and then it got a little deeper it was more like i think it's the conditioning that happens in grade 6 and 7 with girls automatically think humanities is their thing and you know mm-hmm. even if they're good at stem or math or whatever and automatically start making choices which just and the whole conversations around them maybe and again i was so surprised that it happens in backgrounds like ours as well i would think you know i mean i was a little surprised but um and that was just to ensure that that doesn't happen uh, i i set out a trailblazer and we kind of you know had partners uh, with cap gemini and a few other uh, corporates and we kind of had a uh, girls come in and then we you know give them we start very small and we start fun because that's the whole idea right like you have fun and in, and then discover in the process so you design games you develop apps or something like that but it's done in a very fun way and then they suddenly realize oh i can do it there's nothing rocket science about it right and then it's like wow they are on their own path so much so that now i have go- all girls robotics team so not having a single girl in a team i have all, that's the, that's the journey of trailblazer and these girls are from a ngo called avsara academy and and it's an ngo so they come from backgrounds which are again not very i mean they come from very humble backgrounds that's one but more important the parents are not educated okay so for them to uh, like you know uh, i mean support girls who are doing stem support girls mm-hmm. who are doing robotics like they don't even understand what what is why is my daughter spending so many hours at some big place uh, figuring out like what like they have no clue what robotics is but these girls are so excited and their transformation has been so inspiring for everybody that uh, i think we are just about to start a robotic revolution in in girls only i feel sometimes you know it's just that i need a lot of like minded partners and we are all set to rule the world yeah absolutely brilliant brilliant work and i think so inspiring it's also so insp- i mean i know that my when my daughter was trying to find some partners to go to a physics competition here in hong kong at school she couldn't find so she actually dropped out of the competition so your part what you're saying about you know having the right mm-hmm. mentors connectors finding that uh, your tribe to do things with and you're creating that that's fantastic um i, w- I was listening to this lady uh, claire henshaw uh, she works with undp uh, she was speaking mm-hmm. at the rice summit and she said that technology has made life so simple and easy and we need to take advantage of technology especially when the resources are scarce uh information is far and all that but women also need to learn to occupy space so geeta you've been in the tech space for i'll just say more than 3 decades and leave that uh, without yeah. getting into the specific <laughs> what are some of the challenges you faced and uh, what are some of the choices the bold decisions that you had to take uh so i think uh, i've been yeah more than 30 years and and i started with technology adoption of technology way back even when i joined asian pains and uh, you know that at the factory level where you to do production scheduling and all that uh but beyond that actually for example in hql um, we actually had a program called shakti amma which was again use of technology for increasing your distribution coverage to rural villages and and in india you know villages are i mean there are some about 60 odd percentages in villages right and many villages hql could not reach directly so they actually and this was in 1990s i mean 1990s is like 30 years before those days we just started getting those mobile phones and then we had this concept of shakti amma who's like creating a rural woman entrepreneur so and and that was a vehicle to actually reach the entire village for direct distribution because typically otherwise in distribution what happens you covered through wholesale channel so you don't know what you are covering which retailers have your stock available whatever all that 
Whereas this one, when you are able to actually do that, give a mobile phone, and and that whole story became a big uh, success. And of course, the challenges starting from, of course, the sales team will see it as because typically what happens if you go into any new village through a new channel, then it is actually encroaching on the sales team for some other territory, right? So that itself is a challenge in the first place. But in all of this, I think the support from management from the salesman head is actually most important to make a change in that. And, and of course, it became a win-win for HUL because we got a lot of sales additional and, and more importantly, more than sales, actually, you know where you are selling and, and the whole concept. And for the women, of course, it was a good opportunity for economic independence, which is very much needed. I mean, imagine those days. And even today, it is still, I think most villages, we still have that scenario, right? So it is... It is really a win-win kind of a thing. Uh, the other big thing I talked about, Indigo, right? Indigo Shared Services, again, this was in 2002, where um, when we started, there was a lot of resistance. I mean, the resistance was because we were using technology to offshore and uh, like a captive center in a way. And um, But then we went to, and there was no mandate from Unilever. So that was a big thing where you had to actually go and sell. And uh, for me, you know, I've never done a sales job till then. And then I said, you have to actually go and do proposal, understand what the requirement is and kind of make it good enough for the customers to say yes, right? And, and Unilever was operating as a multi-local, multinational those days, not a global organization as it is today. So multi-local means every decision is taken by the chairman of that company, of that country. So we went to Australia, we went to many countries. I went to Chile. I mean, I've gone to so many countries in those. The challenge itself was even just the travel itself. I mean, I've gone to Japan without knowing anything of Japanese, but you have to actually go that concept because you have to go to a country and then find, you know, some way of selling your services in a way. And uh, so a lot of challenges in travel, a lot of challenges in accepting, I mean, they accepting that you could actually do that. I mean, it was very difficult to convince that you could actually do that. Then we said, we'll do a pilot, we'll do this, that, and also those were the kind of things, but it was all enabled by technology. Of course, we also had a lot of women in that because mm -hmm. those days, this was, this was not the call center. It was more, it was not the voice. It was more the business process outsourcing. So it was more f and HR processes. So we could get a lot of women and we even had at those days uh, second career women because people who have had children and once they go to college, then women become more available, right? And some of them, even today, they're continuing with Unilever and they've gone, they become, you know, senior leaders as well. So that actually, you know, gives me a lot of satisfaction to say that you actually started something which has kind of grown. And, and I can say that when HL exited that business, the value of that was more than any brand value at that time. So at least company also made money. And we all talked of startup. For me, that was my first experience as a startup because and everybody was envious. He said, how did you do this? It's like a startup without you having a risk. I mean, it was, of course, a risk because from a career, you have to make it happen, right? So, but uh, it's very interesting. And, and that's a huge learning. And, and of course, you have to face challenge when you go to all countries. And we had people, right, from throwing stones to saying, you know, all the bad words because you're taking away their jobs, right? So those are very big challenges. And you have to you have to be caring, but at the same time, you have to also do the right things to make sure, you know, it makes it a win-win. Because finally, the country also has to win and you have to also win. So in a way, it's, that's, I think, really how you manage things. So. Oh, fantastic. And, and, you know, this whole journey, we talk a lot more definitely about return to work now. There are dedicated portals and organizations mm -hmm. in that space mm -hmm. to say that something like this happened at a time when it was not popular or common yes. or catchwordy, yes. uh, so to say. That's uh, absolutely yes. brilliant. And, you know, uh, of course, my, you know, my first uh, employer as well. So always proud of all yes. the things that leave us. It's left so much of, I mean, we call it the CEO factory, but I think it's also a lot of process factory about how to put things in place and how to make it win. So that's that's really great to know. Um, and I think we talked of working in a large company, right? While you work in Unilever, while it's a large company, you don't get the feeling of being large because you've got so much of empowerment to do whatever you want to do. I mean, that ability to take risk and, and the whole entrepreneurial thing is, is very much built into the culture. True, true. Um, Shivangi, you know, if, I mean, innovation, you know, we talk about it as a combination of uh, either a new technology, an existing problem and a big idea. 
all of which combines together to get some results out of it. You were one of the first Indian citizens to receive the certification from IAPP, uh, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, ARCA, India's first and only privacy platform, which is also looking at small and medium businesses for managing their privacy programs. I read about a privacy lab for clients to test their systems. So in all this, you know, so much work around privacy. How do you bring in gender equality, uh, especially in the current, you know, work from anywhere kind of a scene? Uh, what What is Arka's role here? How do you see it going? Yeah. So I want to say that uh, in an industry where there are hardly about 10 to 15% uh, women, we have 70% women in the company. And... Uh, the, and I think it has come not out of wanting to, you know, actively go behind that ratio, but it also comes from, you know, being forced to innovate. So we are a, you know, we're not a funded startup in that sort of things, right? And we bootstrapped for a fairly long time and uh, so on. So, uh, you know, we were uh, working in a sector where uh, A, the demand far outstrips supply. And uh, even if you look, you won't find people. And uh, even if you did find people, uh, you know, and we saw this uh, within a year or so, if they knew the you know, spelling of privacy, they were hired for thrice the salaries by the big four, right? So we were very clear mm -hmm. that we were not ever going to be able to retain and we didn't want to become a factory for the big four, right? Uh, so one thing we were very sure is that we needed to find a way to, um, you know, find people where nobody else looked for. And our first port of call was to look for women who had constraints, you know, in terms of not being, you know, coming back to the workforce or having either childcare or elder care and therefore needed flexibility and so on. So on one hand, we started, uh, you know, working with women like that. On the other hand, uh, because we were looking at working with small and mid-sized companies, um, and we also worked with the large guys, but primarily with uh, at that time when we started small and mid-size. And we were very cognizant, both my co-founder also comes from the services sector, so do I, very clearly said that we didn't want to become entrepreneurs just to run yet another services company. Then we might as well go and make the big bucks in the large companies, right? Because it's a, a fight, for the, fight for talent mm -hmm. rather than fight for business. And uh, and this was a very new field as well. So we said, uh, you know, and one day it is going to burst upon India and uh, already uh, around the world definitely is. Today, 137 countries in the world have a privacy law and it's, you know, come like a tsunami. In the last two, three years, these laws have been passed and India is very close to passing its law. Now, where is this talent going to come from? You know, 99.99% of the world thinks privacy same as security and security world itself is you know i've spent the first decade working in that that itself is starved for resources so what will happen with privacy and uh, we realized that the only way to approach it is with automation it was a no-brainer we looked around to see whether anybody else was doing we realized no and we realized for our own people forget you know the goodness of the world our own people to start delivering without having the necessary training we needed the intelligence to be automated so we started building our platform and realized it was a great idea so even so therefore our whole premise is get people who have no background in the domain but have all complementary skill sets and get them to deliver to clients using a platform where the intelligence is built into the platform so that's what we have Cross transcended that journey, and that's where we are today. And uh, we live and breathe what we uh, see. Oh, lovely. So, what is the, um, um, you know, if you have to give some uh, numbers for us, uh, number of women working with you, you said 70% of your workforce. How many of them are like working at an office location, off location? Uh, we talked so a little bit about yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's another thing. Pre pandemic itself, we, we had. 50% of the workforce working from home. We used to have an office uh, in uh, Bombay and Pune. Then with the pandemic, we shut down and uh, you know obviously we started, moved everyone, moved to work from home and 
after that nobody wants to come back so we're very happy working from home we've in the process managed to hire people across not just uh, the country but even people who are in other countries uh, who can't work there and so on uh, so we have a girl who for example is based in nigeria you know got married last year her husband was there and you know a professional of 5 years was not finding anything she couldn't even step out of the house in nigeria so we got her reference from somewhere so she works from there she works those hours and so on so we've always had this flexibility much before it became a buzzword and i think that has helped and uh, so on we've also on the other side sort of put our foot down with clients we've said we will not send people on site or the traditional model we will not dedicate people to you mm-hmm. and uh, take it or leave it i guess we work in a very uh, new field so most people say okay <laughs> you know and those who don't we say sorry we can't work with you so we've also stuck to our story that's nice. so that's what? absolutely brilliant uh, i mean one of the things yeah one of the things that we always say right if you want to a lot of organizations come up with the, all these values which then stay mm-hmm. on the wall when press comes to push comes to shove uh, they're not enforcing this for their supplier network any of their stakeholder network and the fact that you are able to actually walk the talk and walk the walk on all this is absolutely brilliant uh, well, actually uh, i wanted to say that uh, you know i uh, standing your ground is very important whether it's for your choosing your clients or choosing your job or choosing your location whatever i mean i can tell you when i actually uh, i was the first business it partner based out of india doing a kind of regional role and and the job was actually based in singapore i said i will and they actually sought uh, i was able to get the job even though i put up a demand saying i'll work out of bangalore so so once you create that you know you take that bold move but you should also stand your ground because it's not I mean, as long as you're professional and you deliver performance what finally matters is performance right so but i think that's the kind of thing i think women should establish rather than you know shying away from it oh that job i can't take i mean you have to take a tough job and show that you can actually deliver without actually having to do compromises you know so i think that's something what it's interesting to see how you're doing it in a startup where you say no to clients right i mean that's really something but that's i think what women should do so always <laughs> i also with uh, one more point i want to sorry to to interrupt yeah. one more point i wanted to make a uh, bring up was about culture you know i mm. my last corporate job uh, i had a boss who would you know classic everybody would saunter in at 11 and then they would start calling meetings at 7 and i uh, on words and i saw so many girls in the team over a period of time move out so i think one thing i said is that you know we have to have boundaries and uh, so we are very particular that unless there's an emergency we will not call outside office hours and over weekends and stuff like that but we find people you know without asking you know mm-hmm. making that extra which we realize if you give people the freedom don't breathe down their neck so we have uh, today we have people who will happily say okay i have to go to my kids school for 2 hours i won't be there this time to this mm. time any questions we have a uh, you know not just women guys so i have a, there's a guy in our team who plays football 3 days a week to uh, you know from 3 to 5 so he's blocked it in his calendar and told everyone i'm playing football at that time i think i really like the mm. transparency that has built in over the culture and now with calendar sharing it's become so convenient you can actually block that time and then you know what time you are i mean i've seen people who work with me in us i mean when i had a global team so she used to say 7:30 to 8 in the morning i have to drop my child so you know that time i can do meeting before 7:30 or after 8 so they're very very clear and, and as long as you make that very clear and transparent things work i think that's nice that's also in a way a harnessing technology to do something which is yes. more equitable right so yes. um, um that uh, it can happen in small ways it can happen in big ways yeah. but using some of this uh, to do that yeah just the calendar sharing yeah you know as <laughs> simple as that thing. but it's a yeah. tech tool that we are enabling that right? um, and especially now with uh, across all the time zones it is so convenient and so they can just choose what time you want i mean there are people who actually do work at 10 to 12 in the night because then you know kids have gone to sleep so then you have time so like that so it's quite flexible yeah. all enabled by technology so yeah um 
Meenal, I want to go back to uh, something that you mentioned, one about the underprivileged communities, uh, again, you know, how technology is making a difference in their life for them to see things, and also about how you use innovation technology and mentorship as a way to leverage that. Uh, I think the mentoring part in technology is probably in sometimes understated. Uh, so if you can just talk us about, especially in your work with underprivileged communities, how is that working for you? Yeah, it's actually um, giving them the power to believe that, you know, they can change things. And the way it's happening is, if I were just to give you an example, um, uh, so in like uh, early uh, days of pandemic when you know when these communities uh, when these NGOs had reached out uh, for laptops uh, you know they had just started to think that they would only learn digital literacy because the schools had shut down right uh, but when they saw that I was doing robotics with kids from uh, the uh, from the privileged schools or from in the IB schools um, they came to me saying that you know um, can we also learn this so that was the first thing right they just enrolled for digital literacy and then they wanted to do robotics and I said, I'm fine. I have no issues. Just that I don't have budgets. And these are pretty expensive competitions. So I said that, um, why don't you guys learn? And I'm happy to, uh, you know, basically mentor. Um, and that's where the mentorship comes in, you know, because they, the mentors who work with them actually were people who said that, there's, I mean, let's just go ahead and do whatever. Like we didn't have very high end parts. We had very basic parts. These teams would come every single day and were, spend like good seven, eight hours every single day of their, you know, a solid day life here learning things so they learned computer design they learned uh, uh, programming they learned a whole lot of stuff and all of that was then used to build a robot when they went to the competition in march they beat the uh, international teams hall uh, the international school teams hall on they reached the finalists of the of that competition these kids didn't know what had happened wow. and not only that so they were so uh, uh, basically their journey was so empowering that later on they were chosen to represent india at something called the first global challenge which is the olympics of robotics for high school students and there they went on and these kids were people from backgrounds where the one of the father was a rickshaw driver or the other parent was a, a food seller and those kind of backgrounds, you know. So in those kind of backgrounds, say, uh, there was a girl who traveled two hours one way. So she stayed at Neral, which is actually Mathiran, which is a hill station in Mumbai. They traveled two hours one way to come and learn. So there were multiple stories where the only common thread was that they were a curious, they were hungry and they were passionate to learn more. And even at the World uh, uh, Robotics Competition that we went to, they got the gold medal for their international journey. And that was such a big thing because they beat so many countries mm -hmm. and for them to discover again, right? So now some of these girls um, have decided, they were earlier doing some other things, but now they've decided to actually take a gap year and pursue engineering next year. And so that's the power. And they know like, you know, they, so these mentors are role models. So they want to be like their mentors. They want to like, you know, and some of these kids who've been with me since 2021, I have now gone on to become mentors to the kids from their communities only and doing a fab job. So when I yesterday was talking to one new kid who come and I said, what is, why have you joined? He says, Mujhe Paras bhai banna. So Paras is one of those guys who's like, you know, really done well for himself. And he says, Mujhe Paras bhai banna. So they are role models to so many. So it's like, you know, seed is sowed and now this whole mm -hmm. thing is just going to like, you know, basically uh, just take off, I feel in that sense. Wow, what fantastic impact and what kind of footprints, right? Uh, creating this role model, building capacity internal mm. within the community. And the other it's thing is, you know, out. yeah, and the other thing is they don't now, uh, so basically now that you've discovered the power of science, they don't look at their backgrounds. It is mm. complete fearlessness. So it doesn't matter whether somebody's privileged or not. They're all friends. So I have like around, you know, we are going for a competition to Pune this, uh, whatever, this weekend. And I have nine NGO teams, each have 15 kids. So they are like around 130, 30 odd kids there. And I have three kids from schools like the Ambani school and all. So they are around 45 kids there. But they all mingle. They all are basically really good friends. They all cheer for each other. So it's like a community of people who don't know which background. So these kids mm -hmm. come in a mercy. These guys just come in the train. But here it's the guy who's, who knows his stuff was more about everything right so it's like that so you're like leveling the playground and you're also yes. creating a level playground both both ways so which is like you know uh, touching it at most important places um shivangi, yeah yeah um shivangi uh, you know i was uh, listening to this uh, ai researcher google ai researcher dr aparna taneja she was talking about using ai to improve maternal and child health outcomes so she was talking about balancing innovation with 
patient privacy and safety. So again, working in the privacy space, how how was I? What are you seeing in terms of trends in using AI for? Again, I'm looking at maternal and child outcomes as linked to you know creating some bandwidth for gender gender equality. What are some of the trends that you're seeing? Yeah, I think the world is struggling to really find answers like it always does. So one of the challenges that um, or the risks that privacy uh, tries is basically addressing is to see that data, your personal data is not used for purposes that you have not consented to. And that's the crux. Now, in, in while using AI, a lot of data that gets used and then the outcomes that come out of, uh, you know, ML and stuff like that, uh, tend to be then for purposes which, you know, when <clears throat> say your data is being used, is, is not anticipated at all. Um, and therefore, you know, before you know it, things spiral out of control. So all these things that you're seeing, in fact, uh, just yesterday, uh, or I think two days back, there's a, a bill introduced in the uh, in the US, which is saying that health data plus location data, that combination uh, needs to be regulated because more and more they're finding that, you know, the social media companies as well as data brokers are selling that data. And therefore it is impacting, uh, you know, this whole abortion rights in the US, right? Which is impinging on that. So a lot of people tend to, uh, you know, dismiss saying that, oh, it's all about me getting uh, pesky ads. It is not, it is about actually harming an individual and impacting them, right? Or somebody figuring out who, based on your, you know, uh, digital footprints uh, combined with a lot of offline data uh, with algorithms, which are so powerful, figuring out that somebody is pregnant without anybody else in the family knowing it and so on, right? So these are the kind of things that people are struggling to regulate. And uh, I think answers will emerge. There are there are lots of things happening, but I think it's an iterative game and answers will emerge with time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I remember that uh, um, supermarket uh, researcher who was sending out that data. Part of it, yeah. Yeah, there was um, uh, this UN women's gender snapshot reports and all these reports and data is always sometimes striking, overwhelming, but at the same. So it talked about women's exclusion from the digital world having shaved off $1 trillion from the GDP uh, of low and middle income countries. And $1 trillion GDP is like a Mexico or a Spain or a Indonesia right there, uh, you know. And traditionally in the tech, industry as well men to women uh, ratio has been skewed not to mention the high dropout rate uh, so getting diverse representation um, would obviously help on a more balanced view but that's not happened uh, and there are a lot of cases around it so Geeta I want to ask you with again the years of experience and how you've seen the transition what is it that the industry can do to retain grow and nurture more women tech talent who are getting into the industry, uh, you know, to help with the growth, the achievement and all that. I think uh, like what Minal and Shwang are doing, I think at a ground level, uh, you know, education, I think is the first thing, right? Because I think women education in STEM is, is still a challenge. And uh, I mean, I can say in my days, but even today, I think how many people get into actual engineering itself is, is still a challenge. And because it's not seen as a girl's thing, right? Or whatever. And, and people, it is a tough thing. And it is for the girl to actually stand up and say, I will want to do this. So I think that's an important thing. From an organization perspective, um, see, there are a lot of these um, KPIs. People are being measured. I mean, I can tell you all MNCs measure KPIs. I mean, at one point of time, they even say that we'll recruit only women. So for some positions, they actually don't even uh, you know, get profiles of men. In fact, one colleague of mine actually asked me, why is that in India you're getting only women profiles? <laughs> so I said, no, no. I, I actually told him, no, no, it's actually a filter at the HR level. So, so I, I think that's it's an artificial thing, right? Because that's not going to... See, finally, I think competence has to be gender. So it has to be competence which actually uh, is most prominent. 
you can't just take based on gender and, and in fact that is a bigger problem actually in some companies because of so much of focus on uh, you know all the global companies now started measuring kpis in terms of by work level how many what is the percentage of women and things and because there is a lot of men are actually leaving the company and unilever that was very clearly happening in many companies it is happening so that's a, another kind of problem but in tech industry i think uh, especially in india or even global but in india most of the tech companies are all facing us market right us market or europe market and that means really travel and and that is a big big challenge for because if you're not with the customer then you're not doing the right job which i think becomes a challenge for women in general there are some women um, not some quite a few women in the leadership positions in in it companies but they are still very few and and it's difficult and they also have a lot of sacrifices they had to make right so it's not very easy so most of them they have the family in india so they go so a lot of that happens so that's the challenge but i think travel and and the place because mostly on site is where the real work is nobody wants to do back end work because back end work is boring i mean boring means you just stare at a screen and you don't even know what you're doing I mean, I know of college kids who want to get into you in know any of the new companies. They actually say, "I'm doing morning, evening, some coding job, but I don't even understand how it's impacting uh, somebody's life." Right? So people don't see it. So only front end job is most important, and front end jobs obviously means travel. I think that's been the big challenge. But at a leadership level, people are taking. I mean, today if you see most companies in India, the head of that company is all women, right? Whether it's Accenture, everywhere it's it's big. But that's at that level. it's difficult to increase at the lower level because of the challenges but people are now i think with working from uh, flexible working hybrid working all of that it's actually two ways so because in hybrid working it's even I, i keep reading that number of women has dropped because of that because women once they are at home uh, you know it's it's difficult not to focus on other things as well so you have to focus on your job but you know nobody does the 9 to 5 then there is some distraction somebody is at the doors and then going open so all that things also happen so they they lose that focus i've seen one of my nephews actually niece actually she is actually doing when she works from home very amazing i mean she does 9 to 7 or whatever time till that time she doesn't just open anybody i mean nobody can talk to her even even a child who's just 2 year old child also knows but the child knows that you know mama is available only after 7 in the evening so i think that's a kind of discipline women should bring in in terms of your own work because only then you can actually be successful otherwise it is difficult i mean it's not easy no job is easy today unless you give your full self so i think that's the challenge yeah i think that boundary uh, setting which is yes. pretty important in terms of how we are working and equally true from the other side for burnout to set boundaries about when you're working from home or working from anywhere when you're uh, i mean there is no transitional buffer of you shutting the laptop down so you know yeah. learning to do that as well no thanks thanks kid um you know time always flies when we're having fun now or discussing uh, interesting oh, yes, things that's yeah. happening um <laughs> i want to ask each of you quickly uh, what's next for you in your journey uh and also for any closing words uh you know really uh, one minute each kind of thing uh, what's next uh, meenal do you want to uh, go what's next what have you lined up you have the competition of the weekend of course but other than that um you're on mute meenal, you're on mute meenal sorry as i said it's a dream to start a robotic revolution in india because i feel through that it's like there's so much to learn in terms of not not just technical skills but also team working time management and a whole lot of soft skills you know that kids learn so that's something that i would want to take this to every single child uh, you know and touch their lives to give them the power of changing things around them right that's one and yeah so that's basically what i want to do shivangi so we are at the cusp of major scale up at the company so life in the last uh, what we've known in the last 10 years is going to be very different from what we will see in the next 2 3 years and that's what we are gearing up for mm-hmm. geeta what's up with you <laughs> yeah uh, i think as part of my own um, consulting journey i've been working with many companies who actually where we've helping women i work 
with I mentor women startups. So actually, you know, trying to help them establish and, and do uh, be firm on the ground. I think that's kind of what gives me joy. But I, I mean, listening to all of these, I think I, I still have a long way to go. So I have to do a lot more, I guess. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, uh, Geeta Minal Shivangi, thank you so much for your time and sharing your experiences. Uh, special thanks to Shalini, who's woken up really early to be in the call. But more than that, uh, she was the you know, wind beneath all our wings in the first year when we started this Women's Day program. And even this year, Shalini is the trigger. So thank you, Shalini, for like, you know, the work that you do. Uh, Keshav and Ayushi, thanks for excellent background support. Uh, but more importantly, also on the notes part of it, I've made my notes about, you know, some of these things and aspects that you're talking about, Meenal's journey, your journey, and Shivangi, your journey. And I'm sure everybody who's listening is inspired to be more and do more in this space, uh, you know, how they can come and be mentors for everybody uh, and pay it forward. Um, Keshav, I don't know how much more time there is in terms of, we did start a little bit early, but if there are any questions, do you think we can spend five minutes in case there are any questions coming up? Sure. Anyone has any question, they can write, uh, either write in the chat or can DM me in the Zoom. So uh, we can take up some questions. Women's SIG at IMC, uh, Shalini were the special interest group. That's the one which organized it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, we, uh, all of us who from IMC, older batches, we never had a women's special interest group. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the women's SIG. And as a alumni, let's support it and make sure that moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we want to know your journey, like the journey you had at IMC in like a couple of lines. So if that's possible. Geeta, I think that was, that was directed to Geeta, right? Sorry. What your... was the question? Yeah, I thought that was addressed to sound. <laughs> okay, yeah. My journey at IMC. Oh, this was in 85. I'm from the 22nd batch. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it was really wonderful because I think, uh, like I said, I, I moved from a small town to I am Calcutta and there you get, you, get, you meet such diverse people and who are all so bright and, uh, you know, you think you're one of the brightest, but actually when you go there, then you realize that everyone is, I mean, this world is so much more talent. World has got so much more talent. And that's something which, of course, uh, kind of pushed me to even do better. And, and that's, that's what I remember from my Yeah, yeah. We are getting some inside I information think about always, you. Always, always fun. Yeah. <laughs> we are getting some inside information about you. You were the topper in the batch. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, no, it, it was my mom's thing who actually said you have to excel in whatever you do. And, and she still maintains it, so... I think that's kind of keep pushing. And I think that's for everybody, right? If you keep, you have to keep pushing yourself harder and harder. And, and now I'm, in fact, I'm actually very inspired by all of you saying so much. And, and I have to actually go back and think what I should do next. So I think we're just, obviously, there's a collaboration opportunity right there uh, with the kind of uh, background that you have, uh, you know, to work with to work with Meenal, to work with Shivangi, I'm sure they'll be really, yeah, really yeah. thrilled to do that. Okay, if there is no other questions, uh, thank you all once again. Uh, thanks for being here, joining us. Um, we've managed to record most of it. Uh, we missed the initial part of the conversation from yours, Geeta. Sorry about that, but uh, thanks and very, very enjoyable uh, and hope to catch you again. Thanks. Over to you, Keshav. Thanks for doing a wonderful job of moderating. Song. Yes. Thank Cheers. you, Sangri. It was a pleasure to have you on this panel. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.